somehow uh, it may come on like just like it's coming on Thursday this year. You know, Thursday is going to be the last day of the year and Friday is going to be New Year's Day. Somehow you're one kind of person on Thursday and you can magically be another one on Friday. Yes, that illusion has persisted. It really has. And they, they, oh, they do all kinds of things in the various tribes. You know, they, <laughs> one, one tribe, of course, so one tribe would decide about a month and a half before the old year petered out who the rotten people were who caused that year not to work out. Because none of the years worked out. So <laughs> and so they, they, they would designate, they would get the medicine man would get out there and he would get the bones going and he would start lighting up the incense and he'd get the fires going and he'd start blowing on it and it would be midnight and he'd be sprinkling the powdered bat's wings into the flame and he would finally determine out of the tribe what 17 people were responsible for that year falling on its face. And then they would get rid of them. They would say, well, we're not going to carry that crowd over into the next year. And next year it's going to work out. And they would have a gigantic ceremonial house cleaning. <laughs> and you know, that's part of the illusion. Part of the illusion of New Year's is that, that boy, what a relief. What a rotten year that we've just finished. That is part of the illusion that has persisted since all time that this old one, this old rotten one that didn't work out, is now finally tossed off into history. And the new one that's going to be great and beautiful and a clean slate is, is full of all kinds of new fantastic hope and that <laughs> it's going to be different next time. And of course, next year by this time, the, the same guys will be writing. Well, of course, 1965 was a year of troubles. It was a year of pressures on all sides. It was a year of nervousness, a year of decision. However, we feel that 1966 eternally. And all the way back there in the jungle somewhere in the darkness, you can hear the sound of the medicine man. That medicine man that lies deep within each one of us. Doing, 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 doing. That little medicine man that's squinched down there on his haunches next to your pancreas. With the fires lighting up the edge of the jungle. He's smoking out the bats out of the cave. He's got the powdered bones, he's clacking together, and he's rattling the little brass rings in his ears. Going, 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 magically, it's going to be different starting Friday. Going, 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 and uh, there's a lot of things <laughs> connected with this. I can only say from my own personal experience, and I'm sure that everybody uh, who has lived in 20th century America, I, I don't speak for the Bulgarians, I don't know, but I know that everybody who has lived in 20th century America and our attitude towards time, maybe that's what makes it a peculiar holiday, Skip. You know, Americans have a different attitude towards time than most other countries, although they're catching up with us. Uh, America is probably the most age-worried country in the face of the globe. It, it, it's so worried about being older than five years old that it, it's, it gets frantic. Uh, people at 19 already figure it's all over. Oh, the bag's under my eyes. Oh, look at me. Oh, I've heard them say it. It's incredible. And so, so we live in a nation, really, that is, is frantically trying to stop time on all fronts. And at the same time, paradoxically and nutty enough, it's trying to leap forward in time. We are both at one and the same time hung on stopping time and hung on progress. We all want to somehow leap into 1987 immediately. Uh, you saw this all over the World's Fair if you went out there during the summer. It's, it's a, a, some, a, a fantastic desire to erase the present time and to go into the year 2078. And I suppose you get up there and you want to erase that year and go into the year 3049, you know. And, and so we're, we're presented with a genuine paradox. On the, on the one hand, people want to stop time, really deliberately want to, want to hang on to it and push it back, push it back. And at the same time, they have a great delight that it has passed. And you know, uh, th that's one of those curious paradoxes again about time. Do you feel a sense of accomplishment now that 1964 has just about petered out? 
or do you feel a sense of oh well that's that one's gone you know <laughs> and now not one other question too that there's a i think one of the reasons why we get scared about uh, a holiday like christmas is that it's the only one skip that relates directly to time in short it is about time itself it in a sense celebrates the passing of time no other holiday does this christmas has other uh, other ends in mind easter any any yom kippur any holiday that you can mention thanksgiving you go ahead and mention all of them they all are related to something other than that specific quality time and yet nobody quite knows what time is it's a, it's a very this is something of course that causes a little confusion too time is not just a geographical or an astronomical thing you know where the where the sun has moved in a certain orbit and the earth has moved this way and that and finally we're back at the same place when you when you look at it really just astronomically it's a pretty simple process but I actually, it's something far more subtle than that. And so nobody quite knows what to do about it. Do you celebrate? When, when, on New Year's, here's a question. Just a, a, a question that has to do with, uh, I suppose, a philosophical paradox. On New Year's, are you celebrating the, the, the passage or the death of a, of a year? Or are you celebrating the fact that a new one is starting? Which is it you're celebrating? Now, that's why it's a bittersweet holiday. <laughs> it is extremely bitter on one side and extremely sweet on another. And yet, uh, I, I also would like to, to uh, uh, go on record here as saying that probably, and this is basing it again personally, as the, that's the only way any, uh, you can write, it's the only way you create anything is, is on personal observation of life and the world around you. Uh, I feel that personally, having lived in 20th century America, so have you, that, that this one holiday is one of the most cataclysmic three days, personally, in all people's lives that I know around me. In other words, more wild things happen. I don't mean just a party where you fall down the stairs or the, the night Charlie the Oldsmobile off the, off the bridge, you know, that kind of jazz. That isn't what I'm talking about. I'm saying that more decisions and more uh, actual turning points are reached in lives during the New Year's holiday than any other holiday or any other specific point in time in the whole calendar. In short, more, more people are asked to be married <laughs> on, on New Year's. More people realize that the jig is up on New Year's. More people have, have, have uh, done even worse things than that. I mean, in a way, more people have looked suddenly back and they say, oh, gee, look at that. <laughs> they, it, it's suddenly 19XDX. Uh, and they, they are reminded that, not, that they have not moved an iota for XDX years, maybe backwards. That's the only time of the year you're really reminded of those things, really. Uh, all other times, you know, you can blow out candles on cakes or you can walk around and trim Christmas trees or you can eat turkey or something else like that. Keep your mind off it, but people are holding big signs up you know, with the year name on it and all. And so uh, it is a strange and very scary time for people, even kids. Uh, it's the only time, really, I think that kids themselves are reminded that time passes. And I think one of the reasons why people make a frantic clutch, they, they either decide to get the divorce, get the divorce this week, or they decide to get married, or they decide to jump out of a window. You know, the police have a fantastic time over the whole Christmas, holiday, New Year's complex because of that. There are more guys flying out of windows and trying to swim all the way to Spain underwater from Jones Beach or something. But because I, I believe that it is that one moment in time when suddenly you're reminded people are reminded, wow, uh, that, that it is passing. And they make a wild clutch. Says, now is the time to do it. Come here, Mabel. Will you blah, blah, blah. And Mabel goes, she's looking around too and saying, she says, yes. And the next thing you know, it is forever, Phil. <laughs> it's a curious thing. And another thing too that I've noticed that is quite subtle about New Year's. That's... Uh, there are a large number of people who will have their first date with a certain girl on New Year's Eve. 
Now that is a historical fact. Now I don't know why this is so, but it is so. I have seen it happen time and time and time again. You would think, well, now this is a very important date. I mean, uh, most people would be, you know, dating somebody they've always dated. But no, on New Year's Eve, for some reason or other, uh, a lot of people have decided, oh boy, well, now's the time to cut it off for good. I think I'll call that chick down in the uh, cost accounting department. <laughs> you know? and, and, and by George, uh, it happens, literally happens that way many, many times. I don't know how many guys are right now, at this very moment, listening to the show here, who are planning to have a date with a chick for the first time tomorrow night on New Year's. For the very first time. Now, they may have gone out once in a while or just vaguely know this girl, but be careful because this is more than just an ordinary date, New Year's Eve. Something happens, it, it's either a curse or a hex or it's magic. On New Year's Eve, it could be, it, really, it could be a disastrous. And on the other hand, it could be fabulously great. I don't know. No one knows these things. But I can only say that tomorrow of night, the, the next day, this, in other words, in about an hour and a half, we're going to start a new day. And that could be the day, boy. Your tug. Uh, <laughs> you laugh at me. Go ahead and laugh. Go ahead and laugh. I remember. I remember uh, a couple of years ago. I said pretty much the same thing on the air. And I'm sure a lot of people who are unsuspecting who think, oh, well, this guy's just talking. It's just stuff coming on the radio. And all the while, they're thinking of calling somebody named Susan. And they're getting the phone out, and they think nothing at all. They're not talking about him. And right now, they're listening to me, if they if they can get away from Susan long enough to get to the radio. And uh, <laughs> it's a strange business, this holiday thing, uh, especially New Year's. Now, I remember uh, one, one New Year's. I, what is the first New Year's that you can actually remember the first year that you can remember as coming in you know uh, they're celebrating say 1942 or something what is the first year you can remember as a new year celebration i'll tell you i'll award the brass figligy with bronze oak leaf palm to the person who can give me the earliest one without phoning it up the absolute earliest one no i'm sure that some guy somebody somewhere must actually be around who remembers 1900 coming in, you know, I mean, who, who's just listening right now, who really remembers the turn of the century, which would be a fantastic New Year's. Can you imagine uh, when the year 2000 comes in? What a wild New Year's that would be. Boy, can you imagine yourself saying, well, we're through with that century. Let's start. <laughs> Because almost every last one of us, you know, around, all we'll ever know will be the 20th century. So we're 20th century men. That's it. And uh, there must be some guy out there who, who's, who went to bed and it's, it's 19, it's 1899. And he says, well, tomorrow, yeah, boy, I'll tell you, you have to, I bet, the, can you imagine the wholesale throwing out of checks? You know how they have that little thing that says 19 blank? Can you imagine the, wall, the whole scene? But, but can you imagine how difficult it must have been to get to, to write a new century? It's hard enough to learn to write a new year. And we do that all the time. Once every hundred years you write a new century in. Instead of, uh, can you imagine starting out? Let's see, what is this, uh, August 15th? 20... <laughs> it's just strange moments. But 1965 is not, uh, not far away. Uh, speaking of the archaic, this is WOR, AM and FM, New York. You're reminded of the archaic things on New Year's. But uh, I remember one New Year's uh, sitting in a balcony. And I was in this balcony with, with about nine guys, Schwartz, Flick, Bruner, a whole bunch of us. And there was a tradition around it. I don't know whether they do it, they do it here in New York or not. But all the, all the movie houses had big New Year's Eve shows giant New Year's Eve, special shows for New Year's Eve, and you would pay extra or something, and you would come in about five or ten minutes to midnight, the regular shows would stop, this is the movie houses, you see, the regular shows would, would stop uh, at, at 11.45, and all the people would file out, either that or they would pay extra to stay, and at midnight would be the New Year's Eve show, and everyone would sit there in the balcony, they'd all file in, they'd give you horns and jazz, why, why everyone went to the, to the movie house to celebrate this, I don't know, but 
everyone got horns and, and streamers and, and all kinds of confetti and stuff. And we all filed in there. So they were sitting there. And that was the first New Year's Eve. The, the the reason that it was such a uh, such a traumatic New Year's Eve, it was the first New Year's Eve I remember spending not at home, not in the bosom of the family with my kid brother asleep under the day bed, the yelling and hollering in the kitchen and Uncle Fred out there hollering and pouring beer down the sink and <laughs> my mother trying to calm everybody down who's been sick and throwing up for an hour and a half, you know, and, and there was a thing. <laughs> well, you know, that's what New Year's was about, I guess, and and. It was the first time, and you felt vaguely debauched because the idea of a of a midnight show somehow had sexual overtones and connotations of debauchery, and they always had these pictures in the paper. And it says, "Be sure to see the midnight show at the Paramount," and it would show a picture of a girl, you know, a girl with fan uh, fans or, or birds all over her, and little bubbles all over her head, and she's holding a cocktail glass, and it says, "Whoopee." <laughs> And, and so the the the, 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 nine, the nine of us go to this place. A whole bunch of us took uh, Flick's car, and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner and everybody. We're all sitting right on the edge of the balcony in the Paramount Theater. And uh, at exactly midnight, the, the lights were on. They, the organ came up and there's da 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 da. You know they play old Lang Syne. Everybody cheers and hollers and the balloons fly up and everyone throws the paper stuff out there. And within eight seconds, nine fights broke out. It was the first time I ever saw fights. You know the kids don't really see. Guys are fighting all of them. Go and get my get your hands off my girl. And they're starting to hit from fist fight. Guys are drinking and yelling and hollering. All this was at the local theater where I had grown up sitting next to. Tarzan and Jane were, you know, they did do this kind of stuff. And within five minutes, the place is in an uproar. The police are running around. They get it all calmed down. And it's now the new year. And they start up with the feature. And it was a double feature of monster movies. Why monster movies play an important part on New Year's Eve, I don't know. But this was a big deal in, in Chicago, that whole area. Now, I'll tell you another thing that was a big thing. So, Skip, I... I uh, that. That I always could hear whispering about it. I could hear my mother and father whispering about this for about three or four days before New Year's Eve. The whole big bit was to make reservations somewhere. Uh, the, the idea was to make reservations in some big joint someplace where they had a big floor show or, or they, were, they were giving out souvenirs or they were giving out horns and paper hats and the whole jazz. And the, the idea was to get reservations. And the place where they all went, and they whispered around the kids so the kids wouldn't know what was going on. Yeah, I got, Al got the reservations. Yeah, you know, he knows the doorman down there. Yeah, but, but yeah, okay. And, and about, about 10 o'clock at night, they're all getting all dressed up, and, and there was usually one house where all the kids were put that night. Uh, all the kids were put at Aunt Clara's house or something, and, and one of the poor old aunts would have to stay home. You know, she's pretending like she's enjoying New Year's Eve with the kids, and all the kids are sitting around, and half of them are falling asleep, and the radio's going, and they got a couple of paper hats and some horns, and they're going to give them some chocolate cake and some ice cream. They're going to celebrate their New Year's Eve, and they're all, all they just say, listen, Al, listen, you get the flasks out now. Yeah, make sure, hey, has Fred got the booze? Yeah. And they, they've got these silver flasks and the booze and all that stuff. And they're, hey, the cave. <laughs> yeah. And, and so whatever it was, they were embarked on something that was that had that fantastic sin connected with it. Rottenness. Terrible rottenness. Yeah, well. Well, they began to talk about two days beforehand about this scene. And, of course, the kids, I remember a couple of my cousins, myself, uh, there were always one cousin who knew all about this rottenness, this crummy stuff that they were going to. Well, the place they went to, and I, I, it's funny now, I, I don't even know whether there was such a place, but was there ever such a place? Do any of you know such a place in Chicago? It was a, it was a big deal, and all the, all the really rotten people went there on New Year's Eve, and the rottener people went there during the week. When it wasn't even New Year's at all, they, they just went there. It was a real rotten place called the Star and Garter. Did you hear the Star and Garter? Well, the Star and Garter was the kind of place that when kids would walk past that that joint, they would they would they would, they would be embarrassed. They would even have to look the other way to pretend that building didn't even exist there. They'd walk past, and, woo, and they had these fantastic posters all over the front of the Star and Garter. In fact. I remember receiving some of my basic sexual education just looking at their signs. They had one chick that was over 74 feet tall. 
that was a gigantic poster that went up 19 stories all the way up the side. And all she had on was three sequins. And she's looking over all of Chicago with these great big blue eyes. <laughs> and it's the Star and Carter. Wow. Uh, you know, <laughs> and that's that's where they were going. They'd all go to Star and Carter. And uh, wow, yeah. And, and, and the kids, you know, the kids, there was such a vague sense of, of, of boy, you know, this, this, this what, a, what a fantastic thing that must be to go to the show. And then about four o'clock in the morning, the kids are already asleep now. You see, I'm lying here and I still can't sleep. Or maybe I'm waking up. And I hear the doors opening. I hear them coming in. You hear this yelling. And here are these, all these grown-up people. They're yelling and hitting each other. And they're, they're, they're saying, hey, do you remember the one when a guy came out? And he came out and he says, hey, hang up. And he had a pig bladder. Do you remember? And he says, hey. And they, they're telling these awful stories about what these burlesque comics were doing. And this stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm sweating. I'm lying there under the coats. And then I shh, 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 the kids are asleep. Wait, shh, shh, shh. And what about when she came on? We're crying out while the kids are asleep. I was, shh, they make, you know, the little jugs have big ears. <laughs> well, for years, I had this vague feeling. It was almost a mystical feeling, almost, almost a, a kind of a religious belief that if you really want to celebrate New Year's Eve, you went to a burlesque house. Because that's what these people did, you know. They went to the place called the Star and Garter. Well, I'm going to tell you a time, that, and, and this might be a warning to those of you, those of you who might be contemplating such a move. And I always had this feeling because, of course, this was the thing I saw the grown-ups do when I was a little kid. And it seemed to have tremendous glamour to it. And they would all get dressed up and they'd wear white scarves. You know, the men were for the... My father would have his suit on. All the men would be all with their black shoes and everything would be shined. The ladies would be in the furs and they'd, they'd smell like the cold, you know, when they'd come in from outside after they were all through with it. And they'd smell like that peculiar sweet smell and you could see where a couple of them had been sick and oh it was wild and I had the sense of and they, they'd be covered with uh, with old uh, confetti and little strips of colored paper and all that jazz and I did see this year after year after year after year they would go to the Star and Garter they went to a place called uh, oh it was that big place in Chicago the Chez Paris that was another one. Can you imagine a place with a with a more completely uh, nightclubby name than the Chez Paris, and, and they had to spell it that way in Chicago because everyone would call it the Chez Paris in Chicago. If <laughs> and, uh, and so they had it spelled Chez Paris, and at the Chez Paris there was always somebody named Gypsy Rose Lee was performing there, and there were people called oh you know the great names that play, Candy Bar and Purple Flame were always there. <laughs> And all these, all these guys, my Uncle Al, my Uncle Carl, my, my father, they'd say, hey, some. <laughs> they're always going down to see somebody. And, and these, they, they, they actually had big followings in Chicago, these women, these, these striptease chicks. And they had followings like here in New York City, actors have followings and actresses, you know, like uh, Geraldine Page or Anne Bancroft. There, there, there were great, uh, Ada Leonard, there was somebody named Ada Leonard. Did you ever hear that name? There were there were great battles in the in the kitchen. I hear them yelling and hollering. There would be one crowd of guys. Ada Leonard, Ada Leonard, that old bag. Oh wow! Oh, oh wow! And, and there would be an anti Ada Leonard crowd, and there would be a pro Ada Leonard crowd. There would be an anti Gypsy Rose Lee crowd, and there would be a Gypsy. Oh, she's forty feet tall. Oh come on! You can't be serious. What a slob! <laughs> Back and forth, this stuff went. Peaches Browning. Oh, come on. You're, you're kidding. What is it? This, you call her a dancer? She comes out there. What do you mean? That old fat broad? And they, they yell and holler. Well, well, that was the kind of... of uh, that was, that's what passed for, for, uh, for dramatic criticism in the house where <laughs> I grew up. At. And, 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 oh, they had, they had tremendous arguments. And I'll never forget uh, when television first came in. And on TV was this guy doing this this kid show. And I, he was doing the most innocent kind of kid show. He just didn't want a crummy little kid show. You know, he'd come on every afternoon. He had a tremendous following. What I remember about him is associated with the first night that I ever really did it. I'm going to tell you what happened. You want you want to know the scene? All right. I guess I'm, 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 I'm in the Army, see? <laughs> and... Uh, 
and and I go in the army. I'm just a kid. I'm I'm in the army now. You see, and, and this was one of the very first. Oh, this was one of the first New Year's Eves that I really spent where I thought I was an adult. I was a big grown-up man, big time grown-up type guy. And I had a three-day pass, and there were about nine of us. There was Gasser, there was Zinsmeister, a whole bunch of corporal types, a couple of PFCs. And we're all real tough guys, roughly pushing the cool side of 18. And, uh, you know, we're all walking around drinking the beer down at the PX. Hey, what do you say we're going to take in a Burley Q show on New Year's Eve, huh? Yeah, let's go, gang. Let's go. So that's exactly what we did. And we are stationed way out there in the Midwest. Uh, in fact, we're in this in this camp deep in the heart of the Ozarks, and it is New Year's Eve, and we all have a three-day pass. And so the nearest place, Skip, was Kansas City. I don't know whether you've ever seen Kansas City on a New Year's Eve, but oh, let me tell you. And so, so all of us, all of us get our passion. Oh boy, we're rubbing our hands again. Here we're 18. My idea of a really big evening up to this point was to. Go over to Esther Jane Alberry's house and go down to go down to the drugstore and have a Coke, you know. Maybe go all the way and have a, a coffee malt, something like that, and a cheeseburger. And then perhaps we might stop for a couple of minutes and sit there and hold hands on a park bench in the Hesfield Park on our way home and make it just in time for the ten o'clock news back home, you know, that kind of thing. And here I am, I'm eighteen, a whole bunch of guys of corporals from yardbirds, and I'm I'm out there and I, and, and, and the home is a million miles away and a whole scene. And well, of course, what do I automatically think of as the real way to celebrate New Year's? That's right. And so here we are in Kansas City. <laughs> we get off the bus and the place is loaded. Millions and millions of soldiers as far as the eye can see. Millions of soldiers. And the place is rocking. It is wartime Kansas City. There are there are defense workers in, and everybody's got money to spend, and the soldiers are out yelling and hollering, the chicks are on the street. And so we arrive down at the Greyhound station, and the three or four of us get out of the bus, and we've got our little bags with us, our DOP kits. And oh, man, New Year's Eve, fire, here we are, swinging. Each one of us had a cool 15 bucks in his pocket, a three-day pass, and we're ready to go. And so the first thing we do right away, we go to the information place where they have for the soldiers there, USO information. We walk up, and here's this kind of little old lady. Little old lady, you know, with the white hair. You know, the kind that you always see at the information booth for the boys. And we go up and say, hey, uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you ask her, Carl, go ahead. Carl looked older than anybody else. He said, ask her, Carl. Uh, madam, <clears throat> uh, we're, we're looking for a place to uh, celebrate New Year's. Celebrate New Year's, you know. Oh, yes, of course. Well, down at the YWCA, they're having a cider social, and I'm sure you... <laughs> you know, somebody nudges how bad cider social. YWCA, wow, oh, boy. <laughs> yes, and at the YMCA, they're having a donut roast, and uh, I, I think, oh, I think you'll like this one. Over at the Hotel Claiborne, they're having a special fashion show, a midnight fashion show, and it's free to servicemen. And I have one here. Here's an invitation from the Bnei Brith. Now there, and so the you know we're all standing right, baby. You know, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Give us the tickets. And so she gave us three or four tickets. We said, "I'm going to split." And so we out we go, and we turn the corner, and there, standing in the in the doorway, is this little man with a big gray cap. I say, "Hey, you guys, psst, hey." Hey, 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 you guys. He's waiting outside the bus station. Say, hey, you guys. Yeah, for New Year's? I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right away, we could see the real thing. Say, said, you guys in for New Year's? Yeah, yeah. He said, listen, how'd you like to see a show? And there's a moment of silence. Since Meister says, show? What kind of show? Don't ask. A show, man. It's New Year's. After, yeah. Okay, where? He says, here. He says, I've got... How many guys? By a coincidence, five tickets. <laughs> yes, these are the last five. It's only $8.50 each. And so, boom, 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 pow, pow, we're shelling out. We got the pace for it. <laughs> we are home scot-free. And now all we got to do is wait till midnight. And so we're walking around from one joint to the next. And there's bars. And this place is called the Bamboo Inn. And this place is called the Flamingo Bar. And, all you know, all those great, the Bluebird Bar. This place is called Uncle Ned's. I remember all these terrible joints in Kansas City. And, you know, Kansas City 
is probably one of the great swinging towns of all. This is a great gangster town. And you would walk down the street in Kansas City, especially at that time. Uh, it's kind of vaguely dark and all the all these places are all that. They don't have big lights in the streets like we have, you know, big fluorescent lights. But you see one after the other. There's 18 million bars, millions of them, and all of them. You hear this rotten, honky-tonk music coming out. You hear just for miles around. Right. Bum, 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 bum. What an exciting place for an ex-kid. Oh, man, bent on a mic of debauchery and sin. And we're swinging down the street there. We got our hats on sideways. We have checked our dock kits at the Y. We've got a cool $7 left, each one of us. We each have two water drinks under our belt now. Our eyeballs are spinning. Our teeth are sweating. Our ears are itching, and our knees are loose. We're ready to go. We're in Kansas City. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> you don't want to hear the rest of the story, do you? You really do? Well, a couple of hours go by, and, and some wild things happen. None of which I will sully your innocent, shell-like ears with. What a night. There's no, I've never told this. <laughs> You've never heard me mention any of this, have you? Well, it was really something. It was just fantastic. I, I received more education in that one night in Kansas City than all of my years, all of my days combined. Everything conceivable happened. Uh, almost everything conceivable. I could conceive of some things now, but at that time, everything, I couldn't conceive of half of it there wasn't. I can remember running up alleys. I, I remember I remember sirens. I remember MPs. I can remember guys hollering. I remember people getting hit. I remember somebody throwing a bottle through a window. I'm t these are just little brief moments. And I, all I can remember is saying, hey, you guys, do you, I'm reading it. Don't think. Oh, come on. Just crash. Somebody has. And then I remember, I remember doing things myself. I remember saying, hey, watch this. Boom. And I'm pushing a jukebox over. I remember doing that. I don't know why I did it. I pushed a jukebox over. And it was one of these big red ones with the juice in it. You know, the juice that goes up and down the side and pour it out. It was there. Oh, wow. <laughs> I remember, for some reason or other, being in a kitchen. Now, I don't quite know how I got in this kitchen, but there were three of us in a kitchen with somebody. And we were slicing lettuce. Now, I don't know why we were doing that. I remember being in a kitchen with lettuce. And the next scene I remember vaguely, not quite clearly, was being in this smelly place where everybody is standing up. And they had taken our tickets away. We are now in the show. And we're all standing up, and there's a stage up there, a little little stage with lights. And there is a, a an elderly lady wearing red plumes up there, and she is throwing gold sequins into the audience. And they are playing music, and there is a tenor standing over by the side, and he's singing, A pretty girl is like a melody that haunts you night and day. And then... She got off the stage and a guy went, ran through the audience saying, All right, I have here a genuine collection of wonderful art poses. These are poses the kind of which all of you men have dreamed about. And I also have here a genuine Mexican wallet containing within its folds, perhaps if you are lucky, a special set of photographs from Gay Paris herself. 25 cents and we have taffy. And I'm standing there and I remember Zimsmeister being sick on my neck. He was taller than me and he stood behind me and I went, <laughs> and, and, and then suddenly she, she goes and a large lady, a big fat lady wearing purple plumes came on. And the Tennessee a pretty girl is like a melody that haunts you night and day. And then suddenly there is this little short guy wearing a round hat and a checkered suit out there. And he is jumping up and down and the piano player is playing and he is telling dirty jokes. He is hollering. He's saying, hey, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then he squirts water at the audience, and I'm standing there watching, and my stomach is turning over, and the next thing I saw that little guy, he is doing kid shows on TV. <laughs> well, you want to hear the rest of the night? Well, I'll tell you, if you want, you, you really shouldn't hear. Before, we, before I tell you the rest of the night, terrible night. Was, uh, uh, these are the times that try men's souls. I'll tell you, and they're the, they're the times 
when men's souls are dipped in the crucible of steel that makes them what they are, hard, bitten, square-jawed. And I will tell you about the rest of the night immediately after a word about our old friends, the Electronic Workshop. Let's see, where's my kazoo? The Electronic Workshop. <laughs> that wakes you up, doesn't it? <laughs> At 26... Oh, it's in here? Yeah, I don't know how this thing sounds on that hi-fi equipment down at the workshop. With us tonight, the Electronic Workshop. They are at 26 West Day Street. And I'd like to have known how that sounded on, on one of those FM tuners. And uh, yeah, pretty good, I guess. I got a lot of overtones and rattling of the thing here. And they are at 26 West A Street. And if you have trouble with all that hi-fi junk, which you should have bought in the first place from the Electronic Workshop that you got for Christmas, I would suggest you call Gramercy 30140. This is the Electronic Workshop. They are at 26 West A Street in the village, and they are really a genuine hi-fi specialty organization. They mean business. Oh, by the way, my painting is still down there in that main window, I presume. And uh, I'll be getting all kinds of peculiar mail about it. And uh, if, you, if you would like to see a painting uh, that I slaved and labored over, it's like, well, I mean, after all, every lady likes to show off her embroidery and her, her hem stitching and her crochet work. I like to show off my little crochet work. It's down there in the window, and it's at 26 West A Street, the electronic workshop. Well, let me tell you. I, I, I really shouldn't... Uh, hey, listen, we're going to be down at the limelight, aren't we? The, uh, this Saturday night again, yeah. The night right after New Year's. And it's going to be a full two-hour show this night. Yeah, for those of you who have been noticing that we've been uh, snipped off there a little bit by the Knicks basketball games. I don't know when the Knicks are playing next week. Huh? Good, that's very good. We will be on at our regular time, which is five minutes past ten this coming Saturday night down at the limelight in the village and that should be a wild night down there the night after new year's with everybody from college and everything in and if you want to make a reservation down there give them a call uh and if if by the way they are booked up which they quite often are at this time of the week i would suggest that you take a chance anyway because almost everybody who comes down there gets in eventually wouldn't you say that lee that it's worth taking a chance so if you're in town and you're around in the village and you're swinging I would suggest you make the limelight scene. We'll be there from 10 until midnight this coming Saturday night. And be careful, I'm wiry. So don't come down with any smart ideas. Won't do you any good. <laughs> Isn't that true, Skip? They get fooled. Now, uh, oh yeah, another thing. You know, one thing I must say uh, 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 that, that I've noticed lately. A lot of people seem to think this is a radio show I do down there. In other words, they get the idea that I'm down there with some kind of a booth or I sit at a table or I have earphones on my head, you know, and I sit in a corner and, and do this jazz. No, not at all. This is a real nightclub type show that is done down there. <clears throat> it's up on stage. And, uh, well, yeah, sort of. I mean, on this chick's table I run around. It's, uh, it's uh, well, I, I mean, after all, I mean, <laughs> don't be smart. I mean, I don't you know, they'd be snotty all the time. And uh, I'm down there with the lights on and everything, and it is a it is a nightclub type show. Not really a nightclub; it's hard to describe. It is a nightclub type show, but it's not a nightclub. You know, that's another thing that confuses people. What is the limelight? I keep getting letters, and they don't know themselves down there. Uh, there's a great yeah, there's a great amount of uh, disparity among the various versions that the that the guys who run it have about it, but it isn't what they say it is. Uh, it's not exactly a bar, although they have a bar. It's not a saloon. 
Uh, it's not a restaurant, although they have great food down there. It's sort of a, I don't know, it's a place. It's, uh, it's hard to define. It's as difficult to define, I will tell you this. It's as difficult to define as my work is difficult to define. Uh, <laughs> now, now, I'm serious. You know, one of my big problems uh, professionally over the years has been that nobody seems to be able to put a tag on you. And when they can't put a tag on you, where do you fit? Uh, so if you, if you can't say comic, well, am I, am I not? I don't know. Humorist? I don't know. But we'll be, Oh, you want to hear what happened? Oh, well, I'll tell you what happened finally. It was a very interesting moment. <laughs> I am down there in this crowd. For those of you who might be contemplating a rash evening tomorrow night, be careful. I am down in this crowd with Zinsmeister, with Gasser, with about four other GIs, Rosenblatt, and a whole bunch of the guys from the company. Company came. We're down there yelling and hollering. We're screaming. I'm having a great time. Zinsmeister has been sick twice now down my neck. And they're selling the candy kisses. And the guys are buying all the pictures. And I think some of them still have the pictures. They're autographed pictures, by the way. When all of a sudden the lights went up and the entire crowd were marched into a paddy wagon. Including me. I'm going to tell you this. If you can find somewhere that blotter in Kansas City, you will find the name of Corporal J.P. Shepard, 16098946, Company K, 817th Single Training Battalion, Camp Crowd. The whole crowd of us were in there and booked for observing a licentious and lewd performance. <laughs> And I remember sitting in there with a whole bunch of guys in the bullpen. The guys being drunk, they kept bringing chorus girls in. The cops kept bringing jazz musicians 